So everyone sits around a table and at a certain point in time there is a requirement from each of those parties and if that is not discussed and documented then we will end up in the problems that we've been discussing. So somebody says, Marge says, I need to create the schedule for the concrete in the basement and foundations in stage four. So this is a stage along the model progression and at that point in time some information is going to be required for the scheduling team. And that prompts the, the designer. That means that my design for the basement structure has to be complete at stage four. And the estimator then says, yes, and we actually need to finalize the concrete budget by then as well because we've got to bid that. So at certain points in time, we all know from our own discipline what we require or what would be desired and from uh, an input from a model sense and then the connections to time and cost, it's really very important to understand how they're going to converge, how they're going to um, always be complete as a 5D data set at each stage as we progress through this model uh, as a 5D integrated data set. Who's going to contribute what at what time and what and how, it's, how it is going to be used at a later date. So that's where the model progression specification comes in. We've been alluding to it uh, on the way through the presentation so far. It's a specification that defines how model or the design, cost plan and control will evolve from early phase stage design to the construction phase. So when we start in the very early phases in just zone planning, so massing models for floor by floor or departmental space planning or room space planning, uh, we need to know how this information is going to um, then evolve into element based, how quickly it's going to evolve, how useful that information will be then for the cost planning and schedule planning and the controlling of that on the construction side. We first of all started this uh, a number of years ago and pioneered the, the MPS version 1.0. It's something that Vika and Webcore worked on and spent a lot of time refining that with the AIA and essentially that was a document that was adopted in 2008 as the AIA E202. Some of you may be familiar with this and since then we've incorporated many different changes and lessons that we've learned from projects that we've worked on and further refined uh, the process and this uh, version 2.0 is where we have a, a lot more detail, a lot more um, terminology that has to be described and also a lot more um, of a, a specification. So each, as you can see here, a certain grade beam being specified exactly how the estimating and data, the estimating and scheduling data will be extracted from the model and what we would use to create that. There are also other documents um, that specify certain actions that are required between each stages in order to progress from one stage to another. So it's in a bit more detail and I'll go through an example of that at the end of this presentation. Let's look at definitions. In order to make sure that everybody is completely aware of what the others are doing, we found that everybody needs to be able to speak the same language. And here we have def definitions about the terms that we use. I'm not going to go into this in extreme detail, but certainly we've introduced stages already. Stages are a lot more granular than we are used to. Uh, we can have maybe three or four or five or more stages, for example, within the design development phase. And it is the reason for stages, more granular releases of the 5D data set, is that the building model um, directly pushing into the cost plan and the schedule means that we have, we don't have the, the delay in quantity takeoff and pricing and rescheduling. 
So it means that we can, hopefully with the building model being constructed to a specification, we can push that through many, many more times and we can have such a, a higher frequency of 5D data sets and spend more time on the exploration and the communication of those and making sure that the information is correct and spend more time on um, in enhancing that data rather than just the creating of that data. So stages are more granular. Aspects are what we would like to monitor. So in this case, we would definitely have the model, the cost, and the, and the schedule. Essentially, we can add more aspects to this. Maybe we could have um, lead points being an aspect, and we can track that information. Then we have classes. So each one of these aspects has um, a development in itself of information maturity. And as cost develops, it will go through a number of classes. There are industry standard classes. Um, if we talk about scheduling and look at master scheduling being the first class and then weekly work planning being the last class, uh, that's the way that we would develop a schedule. The, development, the combination of those classes for each aspect defines us a level of detail. And this is our metric for information maturity. It blends all of the classes together and it, assume, it, it provides us a target for building element categories per stage as we go through design. I'm not going to go through in too much detail here, but essentially these are the way that we specify each item. And I can show you a couple of examples there. But in order to progress, in order to take that stage to stage to stage, we would have to have certain actions to perform on the data, on the 5D data set, in order to progress from the stage DD1, for example, to DD2. What are the actions that are required in order to progress this data set? So let's look at that in a bit more detail. If we, First of all, an example, if we didn't have an MPS and we were missing a predefined uh, convention here, we're showing the naming convention for the elements. And it's very difficult for us to understand exactly what these items are with a lot of interrogation. And it, essentially, it would take a long time for us to recategorize or rework these models. So having an output looking something like this as a list of items in a model, it's not a great starting point. So when you have no MPS, this is the typical input that you would get. And the result would be that in the integrated environment where you're trying to use these, what we call takeoff items, in order to generate our cost plan, we would not be able to automatically link the quantities because the convention was not known before we actually were having the model published in this environment. So when there's no structure to that naming convention, we have to link everything manually and it's um, an arduous, it could be an arduous process um, that would not be desirable to have at every single stage release. So what we would like to see is if we followed an NPS, we would have a very much clearer, so on the left hand side you've got the not following an NPS, on the right hand side you've got following an NPS and being very clear about what these elements are in the building. You can see, for example, um, this ZY81 by 81 potentially was a pile cap without us knowing it. And we need to understand what these objects are in order to derive the best quantity data from those objects. So if we had this naming structure defined using an MPS, then everything would automatically link. So these slabs have been created with a naming convention that we understood that it was a CIP cast in place RC reinforced concrete slab with a certain ID potentially. And the edge surface area was the important item with an important takeoff quantity, seeing it here highlighted in pink along the edges of the slabs. And that would automatically populate in our cost plan 
the erection of the formwork and essentially the stripping of the formwork being the two items that require this quantity from these elements. And it would automate this process. It would automatically take off the right quantities and in the right naming convention, supply us with the right data for us to then uh, have an automated quantity takeoff and an automated cost plan, or a lot more automated, and spend um, the time that you were spending gr uh, grinding that data, you're actually spending the time creating um, the more, so you're, you're spending more time negotiating with subcontractors rather than um, cr creating and reworking the data. We saw how model, model develops over time, and this is um, one way of classifying those levels of detail. And it's important to note that each of those models will not develop at the same speed. So what we, when we talk about each stage in the model progression specification, we might have a substructure model that only gets to a level of detail, 200, a schematic design model. Um, I say only, this is stage one, so we have progressed the substructure model uh, to a level of detail 200. Um, but the MEP systems, we haven't done anything yet, but we're going to use the 100, the matting models, to get square foot in information in order to create us a square foot price. And this is one stage using a combined set of levels of detail and it might be that the maybe the next item to um, progress is the superstructure to level of detail 300 and maybe nothing else will progress in that stage release but at the second stage the estimator and the scheduler will know that they have more detail in the level of detail 300 superstructure model and that is where their estimate and their schedule will be refined and improved and if they had defined that in the model progression specification, then their data sets would already be ready and willing to accept that new model. And they wouldn't have to do anything but, up, um, but activate that new model within the data set. And it would create a new estimate and a new schedule. So we introduced the concept there about how we're actually able to more often have a data set released and how we can have more opportunities along the timeline in order to keep the project on track and to essentially provide more, more value engineering opportunities. Currently, unfortunately here, here are the value engineering opportunities and they are infrequent because they are based on major design releases usually. A uh, famous quote from Eric McKinney, he, he said that, Architecture is like driving with a blindfold on. And what he's meaning by that is they put the blindfold on, or they get in the car, put the blindfold on, they drive, and they drive for an hour, and then they uh, get out of the car, and at this point in time, they then see whether they hit their destination, see whether they actually got to their destination. And unfortunately, usually we're off course and need to have this course correction. So we have this opportunity here to value engineer and to change certain items in the design cost and time. What we would like to do is when we follow this 5D continuous process and we have more iteration, we have the release of design and the opportunity to publish and update in that fully integrated data set um, much, much more quickly and having the feedback more quickly allows us to keep things on track and um, hopefully have a less um, random and more certain outcome. 